The Super Bowl is here, so bet with my bookie. Use promo code Gators and get a 50% match with your first deposit only at my bookie. Gators Breakdown. Because there's never a dull moment in Gator Nation. The Gators Breakdown Podcast is ready to go. I'm your host, David Waters, and you can find me on Twitter at GatorDave underscore SEC. Pretty good episode coming up here on Gators Breakdown. Mike Farrell, national recruiting uh, analyst there at Rivals.com. Rivals, you know, good website there for all your recruiting news and the national director is going to join us right here on Gators Breakdown. We'll get into we'll get in with Mike about uh, recruiting in general, Gators recruiting, uh, recruiting around the country, issues in, in, in college football, and, and how he sees it. Uh, he's been around the game, been around recruiting the recruiting game for a long time as well. So uh, Mike's going to you know he, he um, messaged me on Twitter and said he'd like to come on. So we set that up pretty quick and um, glad that we were able to, to to get him on Gators Breakdown for the first time. Had, a, of course, all the, the the Gator Rivals guys from Gators Territory on plenty of time uh, with, with Nick and Corey and, the, and those guys hopping on and, and, and talking Florida Gators recruiting and football. But now uh, get go, go on a national scope and get Mike's thoughts on the Gators uh, recruiting in general and all, all the issues surrounding recruiting uh, as well. But um, we'll uh, also just talk about – Last episode, Brian Johnson uh, was announced that he was going to the NFL and going to become the uh, quarterback's coach for the Philadelphia Eagles there. We were waiting on a hire from the Gators. That hire came pretty quick, or who we knew it would be. Then it was announced on Friday uh, that Garrick McGee will be the quarterback's coach. He he did not get the offensive coordinator label that Brian Johnson received uh, last year uh, there. So, uh, he just will be named a uh, quarterback coach. We'll get into, uh, I'll get into his background, what university of Florida sent, uh, about that hire before we do. Remember you can find Gators breakdown at news jackscom slash Gators breakdown. You'll find all the Gators breakdown episodes there. Help us out. Subscribe on YouTube, subscribe on your favorite podcast platform. So you are up to date on the latest episode of Gators breakdown and find us on Twitter, uh, at Gator Dave underscore sec at Gators breakdown. So right here, before we get into the interview with Mike, Garrick McGee promoted to quarterbacks coach. And it says Florida football head coach Dan Mullen announced the promotion of Garrick McGee, a former head coach and offensive coordinator, returns to the sidelines to coach the quarterbacks after serving as an analyst for the Gators in 2020. Following quote comes from Dan Mullen. Garrick brings a wealth of knowledge to our offensive room, Mullen said. His track record for developing quarterbacks and explosive offenses will fit nicely with what we do in the quote. So uh, it says here, I'll, re- I'll read what the University of Florida sent gives us a nice gives us a nice background on who McGee is. He has extensive experience in the Southeastern Conference, was the head coach uh, at UAB and most recently coached at Missouri. Longtime offensive coach has developed record breaking quarterbacks and engineered some of the top offenses in the country. McGee joined the Missouri staff prior to the 2018 season as a senior offensive analyst. In that role, McGee aided potent offensive attack with advanced scouting of opposing defenses, where he helped break down video, provided initial direction for the coaches to design game plans and strategies. His work helped the Tiger offense develop into one of the nation's top units as Missouri finished 2018 ranked 13th nationally, third in the SEC in total offense with 481 Point eight yards per game and 18th nationally, third in the SEC, and scoring 36.6 points per game. Says right here, prior to Missouri's bowl game, McGee was named interim coach for the tight ends position, and senior tight end Kendall Blanton had a productive day, catching a career high four passes for 35 yards and a touchdown. McGee came to Missouri with a wealth of experience at all levels of the game, as he previously had stops as college head coach, as well as offensive coordinator at four different Power 5 schools. He joined Missouri after spending the 2016-2017 season as an offensive coordinator and quarterbacks coach at Illinois. I can go ahead and tell you the results there were not good. (laughs) So uh, he previously served as an offensive coordinator at Northwestern, Arkansas, and Louisville, and uh, head coach at UAB for two years, 2012-2013, also spent two years in the NFL with the Jacksonville Jaguars, where he was a quality control assistant under Tom Coughlin. So here's the the what people will go back and people who know McGee or people who are going to research McGee will go back to this time here 
McGee's Louisville offense averaged 28.7 points per game, 416.1 yards per game in 2015, a year after the Cardinals scored 30 plus points uh, eight, eight times and passed for 3,276 yards when McGee as offensive coordinator. McGee oversaw development of future Heisman Trophy winner Lamar Jackson as he went on to have one of the top rookie seasons in the country in 2015. He joined Bobby Petrino's staff at Louisville after spending two seasons at UAB and four at Arkansas, where he also worked under Petrino. McGee helped offense Arkansas's to final rankings of number 12 in 2010 and number five in 2011 during his years as offensive coordinator for the Razorbacks. Year after leading Arkansas to a 10 3 record, school's first BCS appearance in program history in 2010, McGee turned the Razorbacks into one of the most efficient offenses in the country in 2011. Arkansas led the SEC in total offense and ranked 29th nationally at 438.1 yards per game while scoring 40 plus points on six occasions. The Razorbacks finished the year 29 and 16 with a win uh, over number 11 Kansas State in the Cotton Bowl before having. Three offensive players selected in the NFL draft. Influential in the development of Ryan Mallett at Arkansas. Former Michigan transfer broke 45 school records and was just the third SEC quarterback to surpass 3,500 yards passing in consecutive seasons. Before departing Arkansas for the UAB head job, McGee was a finalist for the 2011 Broyles Award presented to the nation's top assistant coach. So the rest of it is time at Arkansas all that stuff, uh, his uh, personal uh, life as well. But I uh, ended there because that description summary of the latest part of being with Bobby Petrino at Louisville and Arkansas were productive, but it makes you wonder whose offense that really was. Was it Bobby Petrino's offense or did McGee have a big hand in the play calling and, uh, and, and uh, developing a game plan? All that good stuff. We don't know the degree of that. Dan Mullen apparently does and thinks it's think pretty highly of him to make him the quarterback coach here for the University of Florida to replace Brian Johnson. So, you know, if you're a big believer in you know what Dan Mullen does as a as a developer and who he wants on staff, like I said last week when Brian Johnson left the University of Florida for for Philadelphia, the hire itself as far as being a pure OC, the play calling, the developing of a quarterback. Dan Mullen's going to handle most of that or a lot of that anyway. So I'm not really worried that about that part of it now anyway, because I think it's going to be taken care of with Dan Mullen. I wanted somebody who is a better recruiter and go look at McGee's history. And it's not that great of a history uh, in recruiting. Maybe he can do better now with the, the university of Florida logo on his chest. We'll have to see, but you know, back, if you go just kind of look at it, go back and look who you maybe could have had, I don't know. I mean, I don't know who was available. I mean, Dan Mullen quickly made this hire, quickly made a decision uh, to hire McGee. Uh, the Brian Johnson thing did not catch him off guard. McGee was his choice pretty much right away. Uh, brought him in as an analyst last year, so he got familiar with the quarterbacks, got familiar within this offense. So I think uh, Mullen maybe saw this coming, that Brian Johnson wasn't, gonna, wasn't going to be around much longer than the hire of McGee was probably for this reason probably for this reason, uh, to get a job once uh, Brian Johnson left. So, yeah, as I said, we'll have to kind of see how he recruits. I think the offense pretty much going to be taken care of with Mullen anyway. So uh, this is kind of a, a wait and see, wait and see. I wouldn't label it a home run, but uh, we'll have to kind of see how far it can go. Uh, time will tell. Time will tell uh, where, where, where what this hire ends up, uh, what this hire ends up doing there for the Gators. So, There we go. Get caught up on all the coaching moves uh, that are happening at the University of Florida. And now we'll be joined by Mike Farrell from Rivals. Tampa Bay versus Kansas City. A champion is going to be crowned. It's time for the Super Bowl and it's time to win big. You've heard the name just about everywhere. My bookie. They're the industry's leading online sports book and casino. And it's not hard to understand why with thousands of lines to bet on all your favorite sports. NFL, NBA, college ball, MMA, soccer, they got it all. The latest odds, period. Take advantage of MyBookie's prop builder and live in-game betting where every single run, throw, and touchdown is another chance for you to put cash in your pocket. Visit MyBookie's mobile-friendly website today and get your deposit matched halfway up to $1,000. Just use promo code GATORS when you make your first deposit. 
The best part is they make it simple with a variety of ways to deposit instantly, including credit card, bank transfer, Bitcoin, and more. Whether you're at home or on the go, or on your laptop or on your phone, it's not too late to make your New Year's resolution a resolution to get paid. Bet, win, and get paid at my bookie using promo code GATERS. Now joined by Mike Farrell, Rivals National Recruiting Director, joining us right here on Gators Breakdown, talk Gators recruiting, a little bit of Gators team talk as well. Mike, thanks for hopping on Gators Breakdown. No problem. My pleasure. Thank you, man. And look into it. Florida 10th on the Rivals recruiting rankings right now. Not a lot of room to move up uh, for these Gators. The only recruit out there right now that's even being mentioned to being added for this you know, 2021 class is safety Terry and Arnold. Got some highlights, you know, and it starts in South Florida. Corey Collier, Tyreek Sapp, Jason Marshall that, that highlight this class for Florida. Might add one more, but uh, this class is pretty much done with for the Gators. Yeah, Arnold is an interesting one, too, because he was a Gators lean for a long time. It started off Alabama, uh, then it was Florida, now it's trending towards Georgia. And he told me he wants to take a couple visits this weekend before signing day. Um, but those visits are to Alabama and Georgia. So I think he's been to Florida enough. I think he's seen what he wants to see there, but I think they're they're trending in the wrong direction right now. But we'll see. Um, you know, South Florida is so important for the Gators. You know, that's kind of what happened when Urban Meyer arrived uh, and Doc Holliday was leading the charge where they went down in South Florida where, you know, a lot of people were afraid to go and pulled a lot of talent and speed and power from that area. So, you know, you have to like this recruiting class. You don't like the close in December. Um, you don't like <laughs> a few different things the way it ended. And that seems to be the way Gators classes have been ending uh, back to, you know, Jim McElwain. Um, but the class overall meets a lot of needs. Yeah, I think that's the biggest thing. It does meet needs. It's not the uh, – probably, I, I think, if we go back and look at it, if it does finish around this 10th ranking, will be the lowest class, at least from 2019-2020, uh, the lowest class the Gators will have uh, here. But, you know, they got to fix the secondary. They're getting some major playmakers in the secondary. And Arnold, the, the, the kind of late – Late news is Florida may just be passing in a way just because they're trying to save room for May transfers uh, to put on the roster. So I know that's that that's out there. Uh, but you know we've seen this play out for Florida before, as you mentioned. The close they they feel good about certain recruits. Okay, we'll wait it out, wait it out, wait it out, and then it doesn't end up panning out anyway. So they're they 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 end up empty handed, and that may be the case here again. When but we won't know till we get around to May. Yeah, and the, the old pass, you know, that's always interesting to me is, is some schools definitely say that, some schools don't. And yeah, uh, it wouldn't surprise me if they did say, you know, we, we kind of passed, but um, I don't think they're passing. I don't think they would pass on a, a talent like this. <laughs> and, you know, to add him in here with, with you know, Collier and Marshall and, and Jordan Young and McMillan and all these other guys, that, that's what they want. So, yeah, um, Mike, we saw we saw how bad that secondary was this past year. They can't they can't afford to pass up on talent. <laughs> No, it, and you know what? I get it. There's there's certain schools that have an ego about them when it comes to recruiting, um, and Florida has that. You know, under Dan Mullen and his staff, where uh, we didn't want them anyways, type of thing. You know, um, so if they do lose them out, you know, lose out Terry and Arnold, it's a loss, and it's a it's a rough loss because he's going into your, you know Georgia, which is your rival, or. Or, or uh, in the SEC Easter, they going to Alabama, which just continues to roll through the SEC. So, um, you know, I'd be really surprised if they backed off of him. Um, but I'd also be surprised if they got him, you know, because confidence uh, is, is trending the wrong way. And, and usually you do get that, oh, we're going to save it for the portal. Well, this is a high four-star kid, five-star some places. No, you don't, you don't pass on him. Well, let's dive into the class just a bit more. We mentioned the South Florida guys, Collier, Sapp, Marshall. Uh, what do you think they're getting in those guys? You know, Florida's got to fix the defense. You know, it's kind of just what I hinted to with what you, definitely the secondary. We saw, we saw the issues there. Uh, but Collier, Sapp, Marshall, all from South Florida and are guys that, you know, Florida needs to, to help fix this defense. I don't know, you know, Collier, Marshall probably get on the field a bit before Sapp does, but uh, you, you got to look at those guys being at, at least two out of the three being some instant impact players. Yeah, and I think Sap can be too. You know, he came off the injury his junior season. He had a very strong senior season. You know, the, the biggest issue with him was academics, and, and I think he cleared that hurdle. Um, and he's a versatile kid, so he could play 
end. Um, he can grow into a tackle. I think eventually he'll be he'll move into a defensive tackle and sort of one two punch with Irvin Dexter there. Um, but the DBs are obviously important. And and so these three guys have been the bane of my rankings existence uh, for <laughs> a very long time. So Corey Collier, when we first ranked him a five star, he was a cornerback and a very athletic cornerback, quick, fast, sudden. Um, and came up and, and played the run extremely well. So he had everything you're looking for. Uh, and then he got bigger and he didn't get faster. Um, and he slowed down a little bit. So, you know, projected him to safety. And I think that's his natural position. That's at the size he's getting. I mean, 6'2, 180. You could be 6'2, 200 by the time he plays. I got him as a strong because he likes to play the run. Uh, I'm worried about him in coverage a little bit, but we kept him as a five. So everybody says, wow, that's ridiculous. He's, He's, you know, this is obviously the world of recruiting. He's, he's no good. He stinks. You know, it's either five or stink. And <laughs> that's not the way it works. <laughs> um, so I don't know if he'll live up to that five, but I think he's going to be a tremendous contributor for him. He's got good ball skills. Um, and, and like I said, I love the way he'll put his face in the fan and, and get involved in the run game there. Jason Marshall is a guy who's peaking, you know, so we thought about possible five star for him as a corner. 6'2", 190, because a 6'2", corner is more valuable than a 6'2", safety. In most cases, although safeties are really, really emerging, as you notice, in college and at the next level in the NFL as playmakers and, and important pieces to the puzzle. So they've got two guys that know each other. They've got two guys who can play different positions, and they both should make an immediate impact. I think, personally, Jason Marshall is going to make the earlier impact, and then Collier is going to you know, rise back up as he gets used to the safety position. Mike Farrell, Rivals National Recruiting Re Director, joining us right here on Gators Breakdown. Mike, let's talk, uh, I think, something interesting here. You had Felipe Franks, you had Kyle Trask play under Dan Mullen, now the shift to Emory Jones, and then you look at this class. You had Anthony Richardson last class, more of the mold of a Dan Mullen quarterback that we, we were used to seeing for years. And now you got Carlos Del Rio and Jalen Kitna, two guys that probably will stay in the pocket a bit more uh, than than uh, an Emory Jones or an Anthony Richardson. And look, all the success he had with Kyle Trask this year, it looks like Dan Mullen still wants to have both styles of quarterback on the roster that you know he can he can uh, build an offense with and, and and pretty much build it in whatever form, the, it, whatever success most successful quarterback will let him build it build that offense in. Yeah, I think he wants that versatility on his roster. I mean, it'd be great to have somebody who's so good in the pocket and can run, you know, that yeah. one guy who does everything. Trask, we saw run, and he can do it serviceably, but that's not his game. Emory Jones, out of high school, was a, was a pocket guy, and his accuracy just sort of decreased as he went through high school, which was very odd. His arm strength's off the charts. And then, obviously, went to Florida, became more of a running option for them. But I think, you know, it's going to be maddening a little bit to fans because Mullen's going to continue to use his starter and then bring in his backup, which people say, well, you're going to get him out of a rhythm. And how could you take Kyle Trask on any situations whatsoever? But it keeps defenses off balance. So to have a couple dual threats, to have a couple pro style guys on your roster is always good. And, and these guys will get more athletic. I mean, Del Rio's 6'3", 205. He can move a little bit. Um, you know, he's not going to run away from anybody at the SEC level. But um, and then uh, obviously, you know, Kitten is more of a pocket guy, 6'4", 195 and, um, you know, improving with his decision making. So, you know, it, it's Dan Mullen likes to work with guys that have a lot of work to do. You know, he took Dak Prescott when LSU didn't want him out of Louisiana and turned him into a great player. Um, you know, they saw something in Trask. It was the previous staff, but they saw something in Trask in practice that, that made them believe that he could be the guy when Felipe was struggling. And uh, I never really worry about the quarterback position as long as Dan Mullins in charge. I think we, uh, a lot of us feel that same way, uh, Mike, looking at the quarterback position. Mike, let's, let's kind of rewind a little bit and, and take a, a, a whole look picture at, at Dan Mullen. Been at Florida now since 2018, his fourth class right now. The big question was, can he recruit good enough to, to compete for titles uh, at Florida? History says it's probably got to be a little bit better than, than what it has been the last the last few years. Got really close this year. Uh, you had some highs, had some lows, all in the same season uh, here for Florida. It, it kind of does show – the talent, the, the talent on the roster still needs to improve a bit to consistently compete for titles. 
Yeah, it, it needs to be the recruiting needs to step up a little bit. You know, they they could finish like if there was one class that Mac only had that finished like eleventh. You know, because it's based on uh, an algorithm that we have based on your your rivals ranking and and then your star ranking and all this stuff. And but a lot of them were sort of takes that other people tossed away. Um, and I like the fact that you know. Jason Marshall was heavily coveted by Miami. Tyreek Sapp, you know, Alabama tried to make a run to get him. Jeremiah Williams, Auburn would have killed for. And and on and on, there's guys here that that people did want. So they didn't have guys that didn't have great other options and decided to go to Florida. Now they're getting guys that can choose Florida. But it's got to get a little bit better. they got to close a little bit stronger. And the state of Florida itself has to be more kind to them. Um, there's just too many schools coming and stealing these kids away. And, you know, the problem is the teams that are doing so are going to the playoff, like Clemson, uh, you know, Georgia has been to the playoff, Alabama, of course, and that has to stop. So in-state recruiting has to improve a bit. And I think that's where the next step needs to occur. I agree. Cause like you look at the success Florida has had passing the ball with trash the last couple of years. You had a state that was loaded with wide receivers this last cycle, and all the top wide receivers are going to Alabama. And you can't blame them. <laughs> right. I mean, yeah, yeah. there you go. I should have said that, too. Yeah, you can't you, blame you, them. You just can't. And people, you know, they get so uh, – Alabama does the best job of recruiting in the country, period. And they have for the last 15 years. You know, Georgia's won, like, three recruiting classes, number one recruiting classes over the last four years. Alabama is going to finish first this year. But when it comes to player development, getting kids in the NFL and consistently competing in the playoff and for national championships, Alabama does it. So when you can talk to uh, Corey Brooks or uh, Christian Leary or somebody like that and say, hey, you know, look at these guys that we've developed here, Jerry Judy and and, and Calvin Ridley and others um, from Florida – or even, you know, Devontae Smith from Louisiana or Jalen Waddle. I mean, these guys are all first rounders and kids gravitate towards that. Now, you know, Kyle Pitts will be a first rounder. Tony might be. I think he's probably going to be a, a second rounder. That's going to help. You know, Trevin Grimes helped himself in the senior bowl this week, but he's probably going to be, you know, a, a third or fourth rounder. But until you continually pop out first rounders, those kids are going to go to the place that does. Mike, what would you say um, the main issue is uh, for, for Dan Mullen? We, we, we thought you know, the, the Gator logo on the chest would just kind of automatically help, and it has. You know, of course, of course, it was going to be better than his Mississippi State recruiting, but when he was hired, I had a, a lot of Mississippi State media on. Hey, he's going to be coach. He's going to be a great coach. He's going to develop well. We, we know that reputation, but recruiting is going to be what he has to get over when he's competing with Georgia, when he's competing with Alabama, Ohio State, Clemson, coming into the state and and, and getting some of the, the state's best talent. What what needs to change in, in what you're hearing from talking to recruits or uh, other coaches on the trail or whatever? You know, what, what hurts Florida at the moment from being an elite recruiting school? Well, you know, I'll be bluntly honest. I talked to a couple of staffers with Dan Mullen. Uh, you know, from his days at Florida and back to Mississippi State and, and, and going way back to his assistant days. And he's just not a guy who loves playing that game. Um, and by playing that game, I mean, it's just continually praising and, 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 and praying you're going to come to my school and, you know, going all in and putting up with the, the BS that is recruiting um, as a head coach. And the unfortunate thing for him is he's got – you know, guy like Saban who handles it differently. Uh, Saban likes recruiting and, and, and will be very direct. But Kirby is a, a good salesman and he's affable. And, and so is Abbo. They're very affable and they're the fun guys that they have at the home visit and all that stuff. And, you know, Dan Mullen, as we've seen, is a little bit quirky. We've seen it in his press conferences. And I don't know the man. This is what I hear from people. Uh, that he does love recruiting, you know. Now, how do you make someone love recruiting? Brian Kelly doesn't love recruiting either <laughs> at Notre Dame. How do you make somebody love that? Um, and I think that's why he might have interviewed for the NFL too, because recruiting sucks. It's really, really hard. Um, and it's a constant, constant babysitting. And now you've got the transfer portal. We have to re-recruit kids, um, 
you know, if they're upset. So after a year and they're not starting, you know, they might have to re-recruit Corey Collier next year. Uh, so I, I think it just takes an attitude and, and, and a drive and a passion for it. He has a drive for, for coaching, for X's and O's, for making players better and develop them on a daily basis. But when it comes down to that schmoozy, lovey, lovey stuff, I mean, that's kind of why they lost to Marcus Bowman to, to Clemson. And now he's back in the portal, which is great, you know, but Dabo closed on him like he was his best friend, uncle, you know, uh, everything to that kid. And, and that's what works. Mike, you, you brought up the transfer portal. That's exactly where I was going to go next. We've seen some success for Florida in the transfer portal. Jonathan Grenard, Van Jefferson, Trevon Grimes, Adam Schuler, who, who they've added in, in recent years and going to make some big plays for the Gators. It is changing the world of recruiting, and he's made Florida better through through the transfer portal. I think the biggest question is how how sustainable is that? You know, you're wasting counters on guys that are going to be on in your program for a year or or, or two. And don't get me wrong, you not you don't turn down DeMarcus Bowman, especially you got three years, four years now. If you want to just kind of go back and say, all right, last year didn't count against eligibility uh, for college players, so you, know, you have to build your roster to compete the year that that's coming up. You know, I don't blame Mullen for hitting the transfer portal as hard. It's really helped the team, but how sustainable is it if the bottom line recruiting doesn't get better. Well, if you're the number 10 class in the country, and again, these are first world problems, you know, let's, let's talk about, being, <laughs> you know, let's talk about being Rutgers or let's talk about being Washington state or, or Kansas or somebody who's you know, really struggling recruiting. If you're 10th in recruiting and you hit the portal, the way he's hit it, which has been like a wizard, then it's going to be sustainable and great. It's a good combination, and he seems to have that down. You'd rather have the four-year guys, you know, for the next three to four years. You'd rather have the four-year guys or the guys that are 30 and outs that prove to be NFL talent rather than, you know, a guy who is disgruntled someplace else uh, for a reason. It's not as bad as JUCO recruiting. Uh, JUCO recruiting is extremely hit or miss because a lot of those guys are at JUCO not by choice, of course, you know, either academically, behaviorally, whatever. And portal itself are just guys that really haven't matured or weren't a fit for the school they chose. So I, I think it can be done. I'd rather rely on high school recruiting, but everybody's using the portal and, and Florida's gotten some key guys uh, and they continue to get key guys. So I think the balance he has here is pretty good. Well, I want to get you a couple of thoughts on uh, just general recruiting uh, around the country right now. Name, name, image, and likeness uh, coming up. That's a big, big topic, especially in the state of Florida. And Florida just launched this program, the first of its kind, where they're going to cater to players and help them with their social media, help them, you know, kind of just build their brand. It won't be long before Alabama, Georgia, and Clemson all, all do the same thing. I'm sure it's in the works already. Uh, but, you know, Florida's went ahead and announced their Gator Standard Program. But how how big do you think this is, especially in the state of Florida, where it's going to be first and foremost in, in this state? Does it, does it help Florida, Florida State, Miami, UCF, and – is it going to be short lived because it's not going to be long before everybody else follows in the same footsteps? Well, it, it helps until everybody catches up and, and the name image and likeness at the NCAA level is such a mess because they just don't know what to do with it. Uh, they don't want any part of it. So then I believe it's going to be state mandated as to what you can and cannot do. So Florida's rules could be different from Georgia's rules and that's going to really impact a lot of different things. So right now, Florida is, is sort of ahead of everybody else. Um, and I think that's going to help those in-state schools. Um, it's all about how you sell it, though. There's two ways. You know, you could sell it that Gainesville is a college town, and this is our college NFL team, and people in Gainesville live for, you know, the Gators more so than they do for the Jaguars or anybody else. Uh, or you could big city it, like Miami, and say you can come here and, listen, you're going to be a star, because this is a sports town and a sports city and your name is going to be in lights. And, and that's kind of what LA is doing with, with Corey Foreman. Uh, USC got him because of name image likeness. So it's really going to come down to the personal taste of the kids and how much the state allows them to get. I mean, if a school is a Nike school, can they do an Adidas 
Instagram one-off. I, I, I have no idea. Mm-hmm. And the NCAA doesn't have any idea either. So this is all going to be thrown to the states and they're going to have to figure it out and they'll change it 50 times. So, you know, as close as we are to name image likeness, I still think we're years away from a kid actually cashing a check. Wow. Uh, one more thing, the dead period. We know it's been with the coronavirus and COVID, it's been uh, extended, extended, extended over and over and over again. Now there's talk of a quiet period that may have some effect later in the spring and the summer. Uh, can you catch us up on that then and, and when we may see some recruits on campus? I hope we have a quiet period at the very least uh, after April 15th because that allows kids to take campus visits. Um you know, I, I would, you know, dream scenario, you know, vaccine uh, washes over the country as quickly as as, as COVID did. And, and, you know, we can get into a regular uh, open recruiting period from April 15th and June and, and coaches can actually go out to high schools. I don't see that happening. I think the NCAA is going to be very careful with this, but it looks like in April we're going to have kids actually back on campus and back on campus hosted by coaches. You know, kids have taken visits. Like I said, Terry Arnold's going to take them to visits. There's not supposed to be, and I'm air quoting, coaches around to tour him and tell him all the things he wants to hear. And that's what we need. So that means your official visits are back on in the spring. You're going to see a, a lot of those because kids are going to take those as soon as they can because they're worried about shutting down again. And you're going to see a ton of unofficial visits. So that period from April 15th to the middle of June is going to be as crazy as it's been in a few years because there's a lot of catching up to do. Then hopefully we have the summer camps, which is a great evaluation tool. And then by September, my hope is that we're back to our normal recruiting calendar and official visits will be back on there as well. And, and we can get to recruiting. A lot of schools have learned your recruiting budget can be cut because of COVID. You don't need to spend millions and millions and millions of dollars. The problem is they're, they're still going to do it because if I'm zooming with you and, and, and then the next minute a coach is coming to your school, coach, that coach has the advantage. So I want it back to the arms war and, 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 and the, the battle, you know, that coaches are all on fair playing ground here. Yeah, hopefully we get back to some sort of normalcy in, in life and, and recruiting, as you said. We, we, we need that. Uh, and I think the players out there need that. They're making a lot of decisions just based on far away interaction uh, right now. Well, uh, and from, watch, from watch, watch that portal next year. Oh, wow. Yeah, good point there. Good point there. Uh, just a c- c- couple more quick thoughts on the Gators before I let you go, Mike. New hires being made. Uh, Wesley McGriff from Auburn, Jules. Uh, uh, Jules Montanar from USF. Uh, you know much about these guys, what they bring to the table. Uh, I know McGriff, n- more known as a on-coach developer uh, of talent there at Auburn on the field. Uh, Montanar, hopefully more of a recruiting hit for the Gators. I know recruiting director at USF, named recruiting director for the Gators as well in this new hire. Uh, you know, what do those two guys, or, or what can they bring to the table for the Gators? Yeah, I mean, obviously McGriff, is a developer, um, you know, there's two Auburn defensive backs in the Super Bowl. Um, now, he didn't recruit both of them, um, but he developed them and helped develop those guys. And that's completely necessary, I think, at that position. Um, and as you mentioned, you know, youth and recruiting is always important. Guys that love it need to be on the trail. You have to have a mix. Um, so I think, you know, they had to make a couple hires. I don't know why they didn't get rid of Grantham. I don't know. That's a loyalty thing that could kill Dan Mullen at Florida because expectations are so high. Eight wins isn't going to do it. And Georgia is going to be pretty good next season. (laughs) So I don't know why they didn't blow up the defense, but they didn't. Uh, But those two guys should be good additions. And again, coaching these guys up as you got young defensive backs is going to be important. And, And when you see what McGriff has done, I think that's the most important hire right there. Yeah, preach it to the choir here about the whole the Grantham thing. I, I hung on as long as I possibly could there, Mike. But uh, it was it was time to it was time to it was time to move on because, not I mean, yes, there's excuses for COVID. Yes, there's excuses for not being able to to get together. But every team dealt with that, and you had so much experience. And there were so, a little bit of new faces on the Florida defense, but there was enough experience not to completely fall off, not to completely look 
lost on defense week in and week out from game one to game 12. It just didn't get any better. No, and I don't like calling for guys' jobs, and, and that's not right. Um, but, uh, you know, there is a call to action. I mean, when Van Gorder was at Georgia, it had to be done. It just wasn't a fit. And now you've got the same thing with Grantham at Florida. It just doesn't seem to be a fit. Now, I could be completely wrong. Uh, they could have a tremendous defensive year next year. But the way they looked this year was a struggle, even in, you know, games that they should have handled. Uh, the, the LSU game is the one everybody points to. But, you know, even in games that they should have handled so easily that yep. were, were made difficult games, uh, they're not difficult where they were going to lose, but just annoyingly difficult where they had a chance to pull away and they just needed a stop to take the heart out of the other team and they could get one. That's the stuff that'll kill you. And if you do it against good teams, you're in big, big trouble. So, you know, let's let's just say that they were lucky, you know, in the Georgia game that Stetson Bennett was the quarterback. Let's just say that they were lucky in the Kentucky game that they were able to outscore them. Um, and some of those games, I mean, LSU, there's no excuse for losing to that football team as young as they were. So I put that on the defense, um, and the defense needs to improve at Florida for sure because the offense looks pretty good. My last thought here, health of the game. Uh, you're big in the recruiting, of course. You've done it for years. It translates to winning, and I've, I've, I've always put recruiting like this. It doesn't mean you'll win, but you're not winning without it. That's just, the, the, I think, the simplest way uh, I can put it. And the teams that you're seeing, you know, it's it, – it, it's getting a bit old for other fans that are not Alabama, Clemson, Ohio State, Georgia, teams that are competing for the college football playoff year after year. But you can see where you know, some are getting bored with the game or outsiders are getting bored with the game of college football because it is the same teams over and over again. Is there anything that can change? Is there anything that will change for a little bit more parity in the sport? No. Um, I, I know what will change. I know they'll expand the playoff which is not only yep. to bring more teams into the playoff uh, opportunity, but also to keep more kids in school and to keep what happened for Florida where every wide receiver and, and Pitts opted out and they just had no chance and they looked horrible in that game. You know, had that been a playoff game, that wasn't going to happen. Those guys would have played. We would have an interesting football game. So they're going to expand it eventually. Everything's slow, obviously, with college football. Parity, I mean, the transfer portal – is not the great equalizer. Um, it's going to help, though. But I don't see Alabama, Clemson, Ohio State, uh, you know, going anywhere. I, I do see some hope for programs. You know, LSU obviously broke through. Texas a and I might think, can break through one year in the SEC West. Uh, I truly believe USC or Oregon will eventually be in the playoff as a Pac-12 team. But if I'm picking my playoff teams next year, which I've already done, I'm picking Alabama, I'm picking Ohio State, I'm picking Clemson, and I'm picking Oklahoma. And it's just, it's path to resistance. The Big 12 mm -hmm. doesn't have a path to resistance. The Big 10 doesn't have a path to resistance. Those two teams are so much better than the rest. Clemson's so much better than the ACC that they're, they're just in. Um, and then the SEC, they're going to just sort of cannibalize each other. And we all expect Nick Saban to come out of that, you know, cage match winning. So I don't see parity in, improving uh, for a few years um, until we get some some new coaches at some of these programs that are underachieving. I mean, Georgia hasn't won a championship since 1980. I'm not saying fire Kirby Smart, but I'm saying expectations there need to be as high as they are at Tennessee, you know, which hasn't won a national championship in 100 years. Uh, you win one in the next few years or we'll get somebody who will. And, and that's what needs to happen. All right. Mike Farrell, Rivals National Recruiting Director, joining us here on Gators Breakdown. Mike, I can't thank you enough. I know you'll be busy next week, signing day. It's not the same anymore with, with the December nah. signing day in February. It's kind of just a, an afterthought in some some form and fashion, but uh, still still a big week for a lot of kids and a, and a lot of programs out there. Yeah, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Man, some good stuff there from Mike, really diving into the world of recruiting, diving into the Gators, diving into to the, to the national thought uh, of college football. Really enjoyed that. Glad we could get him here on Gators Breakdown for the first time. He reached out, wanted to come on the podcast, and absolutely going to bring him on here and 
bring a really good interview <laughs> to you guys out there. Uh, really nailed a lot of topics. That was some good stuff. Good stuff there. Signing day is coming up. You know, like I said, not much interest uh, this week. Terry and Arnold's the only one out there. It looks to be an Alabama Georgia battle with you know the the thought to Georgia uh, in the end. But you know, you never know. Alabama and Georgia when they go head to head, you never know where that goes. Or could Florida come in late? You know, if if, if the reports are true that you know Florida's not really going to have enough room. Uh, and, and all that. Do they change their mind at the last minute, throw an offer uh, out there to Ar- Arnold's way, send him a national uh, letter of intent to, to sign and see if he'll, he'll come with Florida. So be worth keeping an eye on still. Things change in recruiting. Things happen all the time. You got new DB coaches. They may talk. They may talk into it. That they want Arnold uh, on the staff and Florida may make one final push there. Uh, so be worth, ke- worth keeping up on. Uh, this will be uh, the episode this week, unless much m- many things changes. We'll, we'll we'll recap recruiting next week if we have to, or this week if you know Arnold does decide uh, to come to Florida. Well, I'll hop back on here uh, for a quick episode here, Gators breakdown to kind of just break down that and what it means for Florida and all that. But uh, you know, if he doesn't, we'll just kind of. I'll be in standby mode, may do another episode later in the week. We'll kind of see how it all shakes out, how it all breaks out. Uh, But, you know, this will probably be the only episode of Gators Breakdown this week. Gave you two episodes last week uh, with, you know, the schedule release. We did our defense preview, our offense preview the week before. Uh, So three episodes in the last couple of weeks. Uh, One today kind of leading into to to signing day. A little bit of preview there, a little bit of talk with Mike uh, and for the world of recruiting. So that'll do it for this episode of Gators Breakdown. I'm your host, David Waters. You can find me on Twitter at GatorDave underscore SEC. Guys and girls out there, thanks for listening to this episode of Gators Breakdown.